share the information that we've been um, collecting over quite a long time. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, the nitrate monitoring data that we've collected um, and other people uh, since 1990. Is there a quick Yes, the red button at the oh, top. Okay. And the arrows are the advanced. Okay. Um, so the, we're talking about the Sumas Lane Aquifer, which is part of the bigger uh, Abbotsford Sumas Aquifer. And let's see if I can get this down here. So this whole area is connected underground, um, but we are only looking at the, the, the portion below the Canadian border. Um, so as you can see, the Nooksack River kind of goes through the middle, and the direction of the water flows uh, subsurface is toward the Nooksack River and also toward the <coughs> tributaries that, that feed into the, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, so uh, the Sumat uh, uh, Lane Aquifer we talked about is this uh, southern part of the larger Abbotsford Sumat Aquifer. And the, the groundwater flows toward the Nooksack River um, from the south to the north um, in this area and then from the north to the south um, in the northern part, and also toward the tributaries that flow into the Nooksack River, and then out into Puget Sound. So um, just some people want to know why this is such an important um, aquifer. And outside of the city of Linden, there's 25 to 35,000 people that depend on this water for drinking and their animals. Um, and why nitrate? And nitrate um, can be a health is a health issue, especially for children. Um, it blocks uh, oxygen uh, circulation in the blood and can result in blue baby syndrome. And um, there's a lot of evidence uh, recently that even less than 10, the, the drinking water standard is 10 parts per million, <clears throat> or milligrams per liter is the same thing. Um, even at five parts per million um, over a long period of time, there's evidence of um, different kinds of cancer and birth defects that can occur. So groundwater is kind of out of sight and out of mind for uh, most of us. And this is just a diagram to remind us what uh, groundwater is. It's the saturated zone um, below the ground. And in the saturated zone, um, all the, the pore spaces are filled with water. And above that, there's, there's spaces in the unsaturated zone. <clears throat> and water doesn't flow the same there as it does in um, and typically groundwater flows from a down gradient from a higher elevation to a lower elevation surface water. <clears throat> and sorry to confuse you, but this time it's going the other direction. Instead of left to right, we're going right to left. <clears throat> Just to show that there's a horizontal and a vertical um, dimension to groundwater, which we don't see in surface water so much. And also because we can't see it. It makes it more complicated to analyze. Uh, <clears throat> so the horizontal part is kind of obvious. Um, well, oops, sorry. Um, but here we go. Uh, so when water percolates through the soil and into the groundwater, it starts to flow horizontally and, and vertically, much more horizontally than vertically. But this is a well, just a demonstration well, and just to show you, like, if you're sampling or if you're taking your water close to the top of the water table, that water probably came from this area. But if your your water intake is deeper, your, your water is probably coming more from this area. So when you take a sample of groundwater, it really depends how deep into the aquifer that uh, your well is to tell where that water came from. Um, and also, it flows relatively slowly compared to surface water. And um, in this aquifer, there's quite a range of velocity. It can be um, 100 to uh, two or 3,000 feet per year. But the average for the aquifer is about 700 feet per year. Um, so why is this particular aquifer so vulnerable to nitrates? Well, um, one thing is that it's very shallow depth to water. Um, for most of the aquifer, it's less than 10 feet to the water table. And that's based on uh, drilling logs that uh, drillers submitted uh, when they drilled the well. So uh, it could be higher 
you know, less than 10 feet in many cases. It's a thin aquifer. Uh, it's only about 25 to 50 feet thick in most areas. Uh, there's a lot of rainfall, of course. And nitrate is a very soluble um, compound that, that uh, if there's water and there's nitrate, it's going to move. And this is just a map showing um, the depth of water in um, the aquifer. And the pink area is the shallowest depth of water, less than 10. And the yellow areas are a little bit deeper. And then in the eastern part, there's some, some areas that are 25 to 50 feet to the water table. Um, and generally, without any human influence or any, uh, anything going on, nitrate, con nitrate concentration in this area is about 2 to 3 parts per million or milligrams per liter. And this is um, one of our samplers uh, doing a routine sampling at a private um, water supply well. <clears throat> so just a, a quick history of some of the area-wide groundwater monitoring. In 1990-91, the USGS sampled about 154 wells, and about one in five of those wells, 20%, were over the drinking water standard of 10 milligrams per liter. And in 1997, um, Ecology went out and sampled 248 private, mostly private wells. And this is, oops, <coughs> push the wrong button. Uh, the pink dots here are the wells that were sampled in 1997, 248. Um, and again, a similar number, about 21% were over 10 milligrams per liter. Um, we couldn't do that 250 wells every year, so we narrowed it down to about 16 to 35 wells and sampled annually for most of the year since um, 2003. And in 2016, of the wells that had been sampled frequently over time, um, about 24% of those were over 10. And this is the 1997 um, kind of a picture of the concentrations. The pink areas were over 10 milligrams per liter. The brown areas were about 5 to 10. Uh, the yellow areas were 3 to 5. And the green areas were 0 to 3 milligrams per liter. So the highest concentrations were kind of centered in the middle of the aquifer. And that's where our um, ongoing annual monitoring kind of focused. Um, and these are the wells that we sampled annually since 1997, mostly 2003 to 2017. Um, and they're kind of focused in that middle area. These are not ideal wells for sampling, um, but they were wells that were available. And um, uh, they aren't always where you want them to be, to be representative, to show if land use changes are but they were the wells that we could, we could get. And, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Don't go back and start over. <laughs> sorry. OK, I'll try to keep this closer to my mouth. Um, so of those 25 wells that we sampled annually, only 11 of them had a complete record. So we had a sample every year. And of those wells, you can see a, a decrease in the nitrate. This is the average of the 11 wells each year. And the red line is the drinking water standard of 10 milligrams per liter. And there's a statistically decreasing trend here. Um, almost 14 in the beginning and down below, um, below 9 in the last couple of years. So that's good. Uh, and then we looked at statistical trends in each well. And, um, of those 25 wells, nine had statistically decreasing trends, and those are the wells that had the blue circles. Gone? Figure this out. Um, the blue circles are the decreasing wells. The wells with no circle uh, had no trend. 15 of the wells had no trend, and then one well had an increasing trend, but it was very low. It's very very low, like three milligrams per liter. So not really. And this is a representation of that data a little differently. Um, the pink wells uh, are wells that don't have a trend. The green wells uh, are trending downward. And the blue well you can't even see because it's um, so small. The size of the dot also corresponds to the concentration. So the biggest dots are over 15 milligrams per liter. And the next biggest dots are 10 to 15 and then 
Next ones are, let's see, five to ten, and then one to three, something like that. Uh, and then for comparison, uh, this is the 1997 data, and the dots are the same, uh, same intervals of greater than 15 is the largest dot. Uh, 10 to 15 is the next largest, and anyway, you can see the bigger dots are kind of, there's big dots everywhere, um, and little dots everywhere too. And it's kind of obvious that um, these 25 wells don't really cover the whole area and don't tell you much about some of the areas that had higher nitrate in the past. So um, it'd be nice to find out more about what's really going on in those other areas. So challenges of our current program are that we have a small number of wells. Um, it's 150 square miles, and when the water's moving at 700 feet per year, you're not going to get a lot of those 25 wells don't represent much of the area, really. Um, they are they're evenly distributed across the aquifer, um, and some of the wells uh, dropped out that we couldn't depend on them being available every year. Uh, like I said, there were only 11 that had a consistent record. Um, the locations weren't, weren't ideal. Um, some of the other challenges, uh, we'd like to take water level measurements so that we could tell exactly which way groundwater is flowing. If you don't know the water level, you can't tell which way it's flowing. Even though we know generally where it's flowing, it can go different directions within a small area. Um, so um, in conclusion, I would say that like in 1990 to 91, there were one in five of the 154 wells uh, that were over 10 milligrams per liter. Uh, since 2003, the average has been going down in the wells that we have um, data for and below the drinking water standard, which is really good. Um, although it's a small sample, uh, nine of the wells that we were sampling had a decreasing trend, 15 had no trend, and the one that was increasing wasn't really a big deal. Uh, 2016, uh, there were still one in four wells that uh, had a nitrate concentration above the drinking water standard. Um, it'd be nice to have a larger coverage of wells to really see whether this is an aquifer-wide um, change. And um, it'd be really good to have properly constructed wells that were designed uh, to, to determine which way the ground was flowing and uh, in places that would tell us whether <coughs> made those changes are making a difference. So our next steps are to, first of all, go back to our 1997 uh, sampling, go back to those wells, as many of them as we can, and resample them. And that's what we're going to try to do in 2018. Uh, we sent letters to the current property owners and um, asking them if we could sample their well in March this year. And we've gotten um, 23 responses so far out of 250. Um, so we're hoping to get more responses. Um, if any of you have gotten a letter and, and haven't had a chance to respond, we really love to uh, take a sample and of course give you the results as soon as we can so that you know um, what your nitrate concentration is and uh, we'll, we'll contact these people if we don't hear from them we'll try we'll keep trying uh, to get a hold of them and add other people uh, other wells um, if we can't get a hold of the older uh, properties and so we're preparing to sample getting our uh, crews together to try to do this within two or three weeks and um, compare the results to 1997. And we also like to put in uh, a monitoring network with purpose-built wells that would be more reliable, we'd have consistent access and uh, in the places we'd like them to be, at the depths we'd like them to be. And uh, I'd like to thank the homeowners who have uh, allowed us to sample their wells over the years. And um, if uh, you'd like to get a hold of me and have your well sampled this March, um, I'd love to get your name and phone number or email address. So, any questions? I have a question, Mark. Sure. Uh, what's the holdup? Uh, a few slides ago, we had six or seven bullet points. Um, <laughs> 
Do you have difficulty getting access to certain areas? Is that the holdup for getting more wells in ideal locations, or is it a cost or funding issue with your department, or why aren't you able to sample in a larger area? Good question. Um, it sounds like it should be easy, but um, there's a lot of obstacles. Uh, funding uh, and access, yeah, both, um, which we haven't, um, we've, we've suggested that in the past. It would take a lot of, um, of um, cooperation and the money. The, the wells themselves probably don't cost so much because they'd be shallow. Um, uh, but planning it and figuring out where to put them, um, um, it would take a lot of, of um, cooperation, I don't know if that's not the right word, but will by a lot of people to, to, for that to happen. It would cost a lot of money, especially to keep it ongoing. You'd have to commit to um, people to do the sampling um, and the access. Uh, I don't know how many people want to have a like, laundry well put in there on the property. Um, so finding locations where we could depend on getting back there um, is part of it. Um, but there seems to be more interest. And I think when there's interest, then things start to happen. So, so it is private landowners on the one hand being unwilling or not excited about this thing and funding with public dollars or whatever to make it happen? Is, that's who the people are that you're referring to? <laughs> um, I guess so. I guess so. Um, I don't know that it would have to be private owners. Um, there's been talk about, um, uh, you know, this is really pretty hypothetical at this point. We don't really have plans for this, but we toss around ideas about how could this work. Um, and right of ways on roads would be a possibility. I think that's what um, the Canadians have done in some of their monitoring wells, um, because they have a network of monitoring wells that, that they sample um, regularly. Um, it's installation of the wells would cost, depending on how many, a um, significant amount of money. Continue sampling. So every year we have to um, commit to people to come up and do the sampling and the analysis. Um, but I think it's a good investment. I think it'd be well worth it. The moratorium wells should hold the That's for drinking water wells. I think uh, monitoring wells, especially if they're less than 10 feet. We would probably want them more than 10 feet. We don't need a, um, a permit to drill a well 10 feet, but we probably want them more than 10 feet. But um, I don't think monitoring wells are, are considered uh, withdrawal. I don't know. I don't know. Good question. Yes? So, Barb, at the beginning, you talked about some of the challenges related to uh, When's the last time we've seen a blue baby in Washington? Not for a long time. It's been a long time. Right. And the EPA itself has said that this data is highly questionable. Uh, it dates back in the 30s and 40s. So, and they're actually saying that it needs to be looked at and reanalyzed because most likely it's not necessarily those kinds So I'm curious why is it is that you continue to mention it there. Is it well, it's Could you repeat this, the question, please? Uh, the question is, um, is this 10 milligrams per liter really, um, should we rely on that anymore? Is the blue baby syndrome really not uh, an issue? And um, I'm not an epidemiologist or a health person, but I know the Department of Health has, has developed this standard and based on a lot of epidemiology and toxicity information and um, I think all the states have the same um,
standard, and I don't know that, I haven't heard that they're really contemplating changing it. Um, and I don't think it's just blue baby syndrome. I think there's a lot of um, evidence of other health issues related to nitrates. So um, I agree, the blue baby thing, there, there isn't, hasn't been any instances of it, but I think there's other health issues too. And, and there is a cause and effect with, with high nitrate and um, oxygen movement. So it may not be toxic, but I think it's worth considering that it, there is a health connection there. Yes? Are you know how the Maurice and Gabba down here in Washington County compares to the defendants north of the border? How are data compares to north of the border? I have that data. Um, I think it's pretty similar. Um, I don't think they've seen trends, decreasing trends though, according to, um, uh, what's his name? The hydrogeologist up there. Um, he said he hasn't seen decreasing trends. Um, and they sample quarterly um, in, I think, 60 wells, but they're at different depths, so about 25 locations. Um, and I think they're still over the 10 milligrams per meter on average. But um, if you're interested, I can, I can send you that data. Maybe you can talk about what's the benefit for folks or anyone in this room participating in your kind of repeat study here. What, how would that benefit your study and your results and them? Um, the more wells we have that we can sample and we can um, compare the whole, a larger area to what we found, we can just determine better whether this decrease is, is happening everywhere is it happening in some places and not others? Um, it might help focus um, um, attention on, like if some areas are really getting better than other areas aren't. We, we can't really tell that from our data now. And personally, you, you know what your nitrate concentration was in your drinking water right away, um, which is something you could do yourself, but um, we would be doing it according to our standard operating procedures, to the lab, and, um, so we'd be part of, part of that. Um, anything else that would make sense to you that I'm missing? Um, there's a report, I don't have a citation here, but um, 
A report that we just published in uh, 2017 cites um, there's um, <coughs> thyroid cancer, ovarian cancer, birth defects. Um, what else? <coughs> I can't remember all the other cancers, but there's um, citations in our 2017 report that. Um, sorry, I don't have a. a Citation here for you, but if you, if you Google Sumas plant aquifer nitrate concentration, it's online. Are there are studies that show that nitrate causes those things. I'm not sure if cause is the right word associated with it. Might might be caused. It might be associated with. Um, that's not my area of expertise, but um, they are associated with drinking. Nitrate uh, more than five milligrams per liter over a long period of time. I just think there's a disconnect with nitrate also right now being marketed as a health supplement. And at the same time, we're concerned about it in our groundwater. It's a little hard to reconcile what the real risk is. Yeah, I don't know anything about taking it as a supplement. I don't think you probably need to. <laughs> at least if you're drinking. Um, groundwater usually. But I don't really know about that, sorry. Okay guys, so once again, um, <laughs> I think Nicole asked me this on Friday afternoon and I was busy the last few days, so I had somebody put put together this PowerPoint for me at the last minute and it's just a few minutes and a few slides. Um, probably a little bit of a different take than what Barb has on some of this stuff. Um, it's something that we, we could see coming, I didn't necessarily consider myself an expert in nitrates either, by the way, but uh, something that we've been looking at the last few years. Um, you know, I think one of the things I want to point out, and I guess I didn't ask the question out there, do you guys know the difference, we're, we're talking about nitrates and we've also talked about fecal coliforms, so what, what uh, Meg was talking about earlier today. Can somebody tell me really what you see as the difference between those two are? Anybody want to take a stab at that? And does anybody know? I mean, do you, is there... Well, they're totally different compounds. Okay, go for it. Physically and chemically. Yes. One is associated with surface water, typically, and the other is associated with groundwater. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. That's, that's pretty good, Randy. Um, a little bit of the difference there, just so you guys know. You know, the, the fecal coliform is going to be considered more of a pollute. It's a bacteria, right? It's, a, it's an indicator bacteria. And it's something that we need to be careful of keeping out of our water because it is something that can get into shellfish and cause an issue. And it's, it's actually even called an indicator bacteria because it's connected with other possible viruses and other things that, that can cause some problems. Um, nitrate, that's a little bit of a different story. That's a, that's a compound. That's a, one of the building blocks of life, right? It's, it's nitrogen. Um, it's something that we ingest every day. Um, well, those of you who eat salads anyway do. Um, uh, you know, a, a salad, a green salad is going to have a lot more uh, nitrate in it than, for instance, than a, a glass of water of 10 parts per million. Uh, I've heard numbers 50 to 200 times more. And it is correct that, yes, in, in uh, in athletics, for instance, they will uh, take a little speed juice, uh, and which is something that's high in nitrates because it helps to get the blood circulation going. Um, you've heard of those who may have had heart attacks who will actually take a nitrate pill to keep, you know, to, to, to get that blood circulation going. So it is something that is a building block. Now that being said, it is also something that can, you know, anything in excess can be a glute, right? It can be something that causes problems. And that's the way it is with, with nitrates as well. Uh, it is something that we want to make sure that we're, we're keeping a close eye on. Um, and I think it also points to sustainability for farms. You know, obviously we don't want to be applying too much of something out there. And uh, we want to make sure that we're applying correct amounts. And since the nitrates are what really make our crops grow, that's something we want to keep a pretty close eye on. So what we did is we, um, this data has actually been out there for some time, right, Barb? But I know you were working on a, a report and, and it had been some time. Um, and we had seen that there were some really encouraging trends. So um, 
we didn't know that you were actually working on doing a report as well, but we decided to, to hire a gentleman named Kevin Lindsay, who looked at most of the same data that Barb was looking at, and came up with it, came up with our own report, which came out, I think, about the same time as what yours did. Um, and it shows, as you see here, yes, we did have decreasing trends of nitrates um, in the wells over a period of time. Um, and what you see up there, of course, is much similar to ours, is where the issues were. So, for instance, the one you see in red, that's the one that was increasing, and it was increasing at a pretty small amount. Um, and then this talks through some of that same data that Barb talked about, which ones were increasing, which ones were decreasing. I think it's important to note we had a 4 of 39 increasing. Some of those trends were ones that I believe the data set was only through like 2004, 2005, right, Barb? And so, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's kind of hard to say that it's actually increasing when you do that. So overall, we're seeing some really improving stuff there. Um, what we also did was we took a look at uh, since this, this was a study that was funded mostly by the dairy industry, um, we also took a look at where the, the dairies are in Whatcom County and pointed out where the lagoons are, uh, sorry, where the, where the wells are related to that. So this map actually shows, when you see the, the, the blue uh, arrows going down, that's where the wells are decreasing. Where the little boxes are is where all the dairies are, although I noted that they had gotten a couple of them wrong. Um, and then if you do see a few red ones up there, which I believe you do see one here and here and there, those are the ones that are increasing a little bit. So the idea was there, um, you know, at that time, of course, there was some really, there were some folks trying to point to dairies and dairy lagoons causing a lot of issues with nitrate uh, problems. And so our goal there was to say it really isn't necessarily connected. And uh, we really felt like this study really strongly showed that. So, um, I think another thing that's important to point out is, you know, unlike surface water, that difference between fecal coliform and, and nitrate, you know, when the surface water runs off, it's done, it's gone, it's over, that, that pollution area isn't there. When you're dealing with, um, with nitrates and you're putting uh, nitrates into groundwater, you now have a, a, a pool of water that's there for a period of time. And it can take a long time for that water to disappear. You can have what's known as legacy effects, right? You might have some water that's two years old, you might have some water that's 50 years old. So I think one of the things that, that um, we want to point out is that it takes time when you have a nitrate issue for it to disappear. Um, this was a study that was done, I think it was in Waterloo, um, that, that said it can take 30 to 40 years. Um, now, different, obviously different um, different uh, groundwater aquifers are going to take a different, different amount of time, depending on if it's shallow or big or whatever it might be. But it shows that um, when, when you start seeing improving trends over time, it, it can take a while to show up in nitrates, unlike in a few people call for it. And I think what we're trying to show here is it's not just in dairies where we're seeing a, you know, improvements in how folks uh, apply their nutrients but also in, in, in berry and, and uh, potatoes and others as well. Over the years, folks have gone, let's make sure that we're being sustainable. Let's make sure that we're doing things well. And I think we're showing that those trends are really positive. So, um, and as those of you know, Gerald Barron, he always has to put in a slide like this, but it's, it's, good, it's important to note that um, a lot of anti-farm activism that we have had to deal with in the last number of years has been centering on quality, water quality. And it's been really sad for us to see that they will take some very vague uh, things and oftentimes say things that are completely untrue and uh, just put them out there as fact. And it's important for us to make sure that we are disputing those facts and, and saying the real things. And that's one of the reasons why I brought it up to Bart about blue baby syndrome is because increasingly the evidence is out there that there is no evidence that nitrates are dealing with, with you know, are connected to blue baby syndrome, including from the EPA's own scientists. They're saying we need to be looking at this again. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that we need to be continuing to put pressure on it and, and look at this. That doesn't mean that nitrates can't be an issue. Um, it means that we need to be looking at this in a realistic way instead of just listening to, you know, the, the latest person who's trying to throw fear in the way. So, um, 
I think that's about all I have from here. Uh, again, it was just a real brief presentation that I was supposed to give. I don't know if I have extra time if yep. there's any questions. Yeah, please. Anybody has this? Good to answer. Um, so let's thank Fred. Um, so a couple of things specific to groundwater that I'd also like to add. Uh, we don't have the project complete yet, but all of the application risk management stuff that you guys see, our manure spreading advisory and all of that, was based on a four-year study. And with that study, not only were we looking at things on the surface, but we partnered with USGS to look at things that were happening in groundwater. And they haven't finished doing their data review, they're real close. But just to, to let you guys know, the main takeaway is we are really looking at what was the difference in manure application timing on the effects of seeing nitrate movement to groundwater or fecal coliform and anything else. And what we did find is that timing does have a big effect. In other words, particularly where I'm trying to say, you know, no application dates, particularly the January, February time, apply when your fields are ready, when your soil's ready, when the weather's appropriate. And there was a big pushback from agencies that said, you know, if people apply in January, we're going to have this huge push of nitrate down in groundwater, it's going to be a big problem. And what we found was that wasn't necessarily the case was that when you apply, let's say, in January, if your soils, this is mainly on CMD well-drained soils, this was applicable, you know, it was no different, or it was actually better than it was if you applied in February from a groundwater perspective. And that was strictly based on timing. What we found is that in the fall is when you guys have the potential for the biggest nitrate push and losses down in groundwater for two reasons. Number one, is that your soil will keep, it's, it's still warm that time of year, and those soil microbes will convert all your manure and nitrogen over to nitrate, but your crops aren't taking it off. You know, your, your grass is really decreasing growth, it's trying to go dormant, you've taken your corn off, your cover crop isn't up yet, so you have way more nitrogen out there than can be taken up. And then we get this huge push of rain, October, November, you all know that one, right? And it just pushes it all through, I mean, there's no hope for it. Nitrate is water soluble, meaning it likes water, and so it'll go right into that water droplet and move straight down through. Something like fecal coliform, by the way, does not move like that. In fact, it doesn't go very far whatsoever. It is not a groundwater concern. The only way it could possibly move is if you have a big soil pore. Let's say you have a big animal hole or you've got big cracks. So in other words, a physical space for no matter what it was would have gotten through. That's the only way that something like fecal coliform moves through your soil. But that nitrate does. And what we found is that the timing makes a huge difference. And it was very soil type dependent. So that sandy soil you can get out to in January, you need to actually stop in September because it's just going to drain you know, really, really well. It's going to push the greatest of any of our soil types come that October time period. And so stopping early, there's plenty to go there. You just kind of shift everything. Where's our heavier soil types? Maybe you're on a peat, a muck, um, something more clay-based. It's the opposite. There's no way you're ever getting out to one of those in January because they're just they're saturated. You can't get out there. So by the time you do, it's a little bit later. Things have calmed down from a perspective of leaching. And come the fall, those are the ones you can probably stay out to latest because it's going to hold um, that nutrient at the top. But my point being that no matter the timing, you can fix that to decrease your ability to have a nitrate loss event, but your rate is still the dependent factor. If you over apply, so if there's more nitrogen uh, that you put on that can be taken up, no matter your timing, that will overwrite it. You will still have, even though you have less because you have good timing, you still have more because there's more available. So that rate that you put on, particularly in the fall, is by far the most determining factor for how much nitrate you're potentially going to contribute to groundwater in your area. So that was a really big one. What you do in the summer isn't nearly as big of a factor. That's, you know, we're really concerned about runoff in our spring period where our soils are saturated. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. When our soils are really saturated, that's not really when we have our groundwater. Our groundwater loss, just remember this is in the fall. So when you're trying to think of like, empty the lagoon, get it out there, let's go, let's go, kind of a 
deal. You're also, if you're putting more on than your crop at that moment can take up, you're really susceptible to groundwater losses at that time. So that's your way to really think about that from a dairy crop standpoint. Other crops are going to think a little bit different. So berries, for instance, um, there's a very fine kind of tune there on how much nitrate that crop can have. If there's too much nitrogen, it hurts the, the berry effect. And so there's a practice of irrigating that through, like, oop, there's a little too much, let's just irrigate more, let's kind of push that through. And again, any nitrogen that gets below the root zone is going to wait until it gets rained and pushed out further. So there's even a reflection in any type of crop that's growing out there. How am I moving nitrogen around? And your irrigation in the summer is like a rain event to some degree, and it can kind of push things through a little bit. And again, you can think of your root zone in grass. If you've got a short-term stand, it's probably maybe a foot or two. If you have a long-term stand, you've got good, well-drained soils, so those roots are a bit lower. You're a couple feet down, most likely. So you're still going to take things up, but we, you know, don't get irrigation right. Also, you're just pushing that nitrogen, and then it's just waiting for October, November to put to keep it all the way through the system when we get all that rain. So much rain that it just push, push, pushes through. Um, so that's your really highly susceptible time. And again, that timing makes a difference, but your rate is a huge, huge factor. No over application. If you're really well for anything, really, it's the benefit of you not to waste that resource and to target what your crop needs but also very importantly from that nitrogen loss standpoint. So that's kind of when you're thinking about those things, that's an important factor. So any questions about that, about the nitrate um, loss of groundwater part of things without asking me what health effects it has? <laughs> that's not my area either. <laughs> <laughs> 